Well, today, let's talk tools. You know, your artist, and specifically your watercolorist toolbox, is one of the most important things. That's just your skill set. And it's more important to flesh out that skill set than it is to always be thinking about a pretty picture. You need a great hammer, you need a great saw, and you need a great screwdriver. You get what I'm trying to say, right? This is a tool that you should explore. Whether you end up using it long term or even every time or not, it will add power, it will add understanding. Let me show you this technique. You're going to love it. You need to get outside more. You're looking a little pasty, my friend. Well, hello, minders. Welcome back to the Mind of Watercolor. Well, hopefully I got something really interesting for you today, and it's a technique I absolutely love. I'm really surprised I don't show it a little more often on this channel. <laughs> it can be quite magical. I really can. As you can see here, I've been doing studies of these gnarly tree branches. I'll show you my reference in a minute. I'm actually making up my own using the reference just for characteristics, but we'll look at that in a sec. But in short, uh, we're going to paint this limb I'm working on here a little differently than the one on the left, and we're going to use a monochromatic underpainting. This is what I'll be using for the underpainting. This is Jane's Black. Uh, Jane's Black is, is really cool. Uh, she has two different versions, or has done two different versions for Daniel Smith. This is the blue orange and she also has a, a red green. It is a completely transparent non-granulating black. That's what's unique about it. It's made of three pigments and you can see them there on the card. I thought it would be great for a nice smooth semi-staining underpainting. Now this is a technique as old as painting itself. Uh, uh, it's used a lot in oil painting. Uh, when you use grays like that, it's uh, traditionally referred to as a grisaille. I just call it underpainting because sometimes you can uh, use, well, not sometimes. I mean, anytime you can use any color you want. It doesn't have to be gray. I'm using gray here more, more or less to prove a point and to show a process. But, I mean, this could be a brown. It could be a green it could be a blue. The whole point is to paint your subject in one color, monochromatically, completely in one color. <laughs> you can go the full depth of value. Uh, you, all of the details, all of the texture, if you want. Um, you don't have to, but you could just put in the major values, the major shapes of value. But it's a wonderful, wonderful technique. And uh, we'll kind of get to why in a few minutes. Here is the tree that I'm using uh, as reference, mostly for inspiration. I'm not copying any of these limbs exactly. This is Angel Oak in uh, Charleston area, South Carolina. Those of you from the area or even from this state, South Carolina, will know it's uh, one of the most ancient trees. I think it is the oldest tree east of the Mississippi, several centuries old. Anyway, it's a live oak down near the coast, and uh, it's just a really fascinating tree, but it offers some great source material for painting limbs. What I'm using is Arsh paper. This is a hot press watercolor block, 140 pound. Uh, what I wanted to study was a couple things. I, I wanted to study... Uh, Limbs that are foreshortened coming straight at you, as you can see the one on the left. also wanted to see how values work to make limbs curve, angle, and twist while coming at you. I also wanted to play around with the textures. Uh, those are always fun to, to paint. So I thought, well, I did the first one, the one on the left, as I mentioned, in a traditional way. It's just colored paint switching colors as I wished, painting the values with the color that I wanted the limb to be. And that's fine as far as it goes. And actually, uh, keep in mind that you can combine these techniques. I did do a little bit of glazing just to kind of add some different hues to the browns. Fine. Great technique, traditional technique. But on the right, uh, we're going to add the color later. 
And I'm just going to take this limb and its detail and its texture as far as I can. Get the values almost completely there in terms of the, the deep darks and establishing where the highlights are going to be. Now, here's the great thing about this technique. Well, there's a couple things, but the first great thing about this technique is the way it separates value from color. I really urge anybody who's learning and, and wants to render any subject and just focus on the values to render it monochromatically, even if you're not going to add color. This will give you a mindfulness and a thoughtfulness just to the values. You're freeing yourself from having to think anything about what color should this be, what color should that be. As you can see here, I'm getting pretty detailed with the texture. I'm even uh, putting in some of that bark texture, which was really, really fun to paint. These live oaks are all over the place in the lowlands of South Carolina. Um, you know, you'll typically see them lining the roads of old plantations or, you know, in historical areas in downtown Charleston, downtown Savannah. Live oaks are, they're not evergreen, but they don't ever completely lose their leaves. They have on them what's called a resurrection ferns. That's a whole nother story, but look it up if you're interested. And they just have these fantastic twisty limbs. In this case, uh, many of these limbs were bigger than, or as big as the biggest oak trees in my yard, just the limb itself. So it was a great subject. I have another painting of a live oak. I can link to it at the end. It was on another trip to Charleston when we went to Magnolia Plantation. And I had Spanish moss in that one. And uh, that was sort of a plein air vlog, if you'd like to see that one. But they're great trees, great subjects. I am leaving a little bit of latitude in the value, meaning I can bring the value down when I add the color. Uh, that's just the nature of watercolor. Anytime you add more color or future glazes, it's going to darken the values. I think the only thing I would probably do different doing this again is I would add more warmth to the gray. Uh, I just feel like these limbs need need it. A very warm gray or, or, or a gray-brown. While this is the warmer of the two Jane's Black, it's still pretty cold. But uh, I think it's going to work out okay, even still. All right, so now we're going to add the color. And as you can see on my right, I have my palette. That's my Mary 
blue watercolor, by the way, and I have it set up into zones. Uh, a red, very red, rusty brown, uh, more of a yellow brown, a blue, and a green. Now, the way to handle this, or what I would suggest, is you keep those washes extremely thin and transparent. That's very important because if you keep these at all heavier, darker, they become more opaque and you start closing up those highlights. And you still are going to want to paint around your highlights. You're going to want to paint mostly into the shadows, the shadows and the midtones. And if you do put any kind of tint over the highlights, just maybe some of them, keep them very, very light. You can always add another layer, and that's what's great about this technique. Now, I've already mentioned one of the big advantages is how you separate value from color. The other advantage is you have a lot of subtle control over how the color changes across the object. You can go from the reddish brown to the yellow brown to the sort of bluish cooler tones. And I even have some greens in here, very subtle greens. It's, it's kind of hard to see in this video, but there is a definite difference in the way this limb on the right feels and looks to the one on the left. I actually could still go back to the one on the left and do more glazing and just consider what I've done there already, an underpainting. But the process I'm trying to show you now, I just want to really put a fine point on how you can separate value rendering from color and how very valuable that can be in terms of controlling really nice, beautiful, subtle color changes. You can push a little bit of cooler colors into those shadows. You can bring up some yellower browns and some of the mid-tones and highlights. But once again, I caution you, just be careful not to close up all of your highlights and keep your values uh, just as punchy if not punchier, than when you made them. Now, I'm using sort of a cooler brown on some of those shadows, just to deepen that a little bit more even than the underpainting. Such a powerful technique, and I really suggest you try it. It's a great, great work of art. Get familiar with it. It probably does not work as well for extremely brilliant colored objects unless you're going to use a bright base color. You know, for instance, a red flower, you might want to use a deep red underpainting. But for these more grayed, gray-brown, earthy colored uh, subjects, and even like landscapes in the earthier, more neutral areas, it's fantastic. Fantastic. So I really hope you'll give it a try. Absolutely one of my favorite techniques. Thanks everyone for watching. I appreciate it. Thank you so much, patrons, for your support. See you in the next video. Bye-bye.